evening everyone and welcome to our webinar today it's the second webinar in knowledge creation seminar series the topic for today's webinar is cross selling b2b services this webinar has been organized by isb center for business markets also referred to as isb cbm the center provides a platform for collaboration between industry and academia in the areas of marketing and sales isb cbm is committed to helping organizations based in india and asia find innovative next generation pathways to grow their business profitably especially in the era of rapid change that is the reality of today's world the mandate for the center is to get research output which is focused on practice and also conduct workshops on topics relevant to marketing and sales Uh, allow me to introduce our presenter professor vamshi kanuri uh, he is an assistant professor of marketing at the university of notre dame's mendoza college of business his research evaluates the performance and consumer welfare implications of marketing strategies within the domains of social media services and multi channel marketing using econometric optimization and machine learning techniques professor kanuri's research has appeared in leading marketing and management journals He frequently consults with companies on a variety of marketing problems and builds the statistical models that aid in managerial decision making. Our industry expert today is Ms. Jigyasa Kishore, who is the global director for SaaS platform at Moglix. She is an extensive ex- she has an extensive experience in product design, business planning, geo expansion, enterprise tech sales, enterprise enterprise marketing, business development partnerships. Jigyasa is an astute planner with the qualities like professionalism, team building and strong communication skills. This webinar will be moderated by Professor Kiran Pereira who is the assistant professor of marketing and a BAT research fellow at Indian School of Business. He has been a visiting scholar in the marketing at UNC Kenan Flagler Business School in fall 2018. at Texas University Texas Tech University he has won the 2017 Helen David Jones Excellence in Graduate Training award in addition he has been recognized for his outstanding contribution to research and teaching as a doctoral student by the Rawls College of Business Texas Tech University prior to his phd professor pedada worked in management consulting and corporate strategy uh, just last thing before we get started we'll be taking over the questions after the presentation so please keep sending us your questions in the chat as in when you have them and we'll take them uh, at the end so professor pirada over to you please yeah thank you very much uh, asta uh, for the wonderful introduction and uh, welcome everyone uh, for the second uh, round of uh, uh, knowledge creation series and uh, these uh, um, uh, presentations are actually a uh, focused on bringing um, academic research to uh, practice and uh, we have two wonderful uh, speakers here uh, one professor vamshi uh, he will actually uh, bring uh, his uh, latest research uh, and he will present his uh, research uh, for about uh, 15 20 minutes and then uh, uh, jigyasa will actually um, you know comment on the practical implications of uh, this particular work and what can be actually further done uh in this area i uh, i i'll be moderating this session and uh, i'll take care of uh, your questions so you can just shoot me your questions directly and uh, i will uh, moderate the q and a um so without uh, further delay uh, vamshi over to you thank you so much uh, asta and uh, thank you kiran and raghu for having me on uh, it's a pleasure so let me uh, share my screen if that's okay with uh, Um, I'm trying to share the screen. Okay, there you go. Are you able to see my screen? Oh. Yes, bro. Uh, I'm trying to go back into presentation mode, but it's giving me multiple screens. If it's okay, I'll just go this way. Right? I'll not go into the presentation mode. Well, the topic for uh, today's talk is uh, cross-selling B2B services, and this is uh, joint work with my uh, co-authors Lena Steinoff at University of Rostock, uh, Jisoo Kim, and uh, Rob Palmetier, who are both at uh, University of Washington. Uh, this has been in works for a couple of years now, and it's uh, currently under review at a major marketing journal. Um, so let me start. Uh, by 
introducing what we really uh, think about, you know, what, what we really mean by cross-selling. It's been referred to in different uh, ways and defined in different ways. So I think establishing a definition would actually help. Um, so when we think about cross-selling, we are essentially thinking about a practice where a supplier sells additional services related to a core service. So uh, this is especially true in the case of subscription-based services, where there's always a core platform and there's a bunch of additional services or add-ons uh, that firms can introduce to enhance the feature functionality of the core service. Right. So for example, if you take a uh, Power BI, Microsoft's Power BI, it's an enterprise analytics service or software, you know, that offers a host of add-on services like AI-based services through it, Azure, advanced reporting services, cloud storage services, so on and so forth. Similarly, um, if you take uh, Salesforce's CRM software, it offers additional add-on services such as cloud storage, automatic lead scoring service, uh, there's a, a host of apps, uh, service console apps it offers for an additional price and also configuration services. So it's increasingly uh, becoming common for uh, B2B firms to uh, do two things. One, um, you know, think of a, a, you know, a transition to uh, subscription services and also offer these additional add-on services as uh, value-add uh, resources for, uh, for, for their clients. Now, one thing I want to clarify before we move on is that cross-selling is actually different from a host of other uh, selling activities or phenomenon that people have referred to. Uh, some of these are probably more theoretical than uh, practitioners may have you know, heard in the real world, but I thought it, it's important to establish this before we move forward. Now, cross-selling is different from solution selling, wherein firms could be uh, selling a core service along with unrelated services. Um, they're selling services, they're selling add-ons, but they're not really related to the core service. Service infusion could be could also be seen as the same uh, in, in the same light. You know, firms could be selling a core service, uh, but adding on additional services that are not really related to the core service. Service transition is usually referred. Uh, is um, usually used to refer to cases where firms are actually uh, moving from product-based businesses to service-based businesses. And service bundling, again, could include uh, unrelated services. So cross-selling in, in our particular context or in this particular presentation will be referred to as services that are being sold in addition to the core service, but all of these additional services are related to the core service. Now, cross-selling, in uh, from what we understand and from our study, uh, cross-selling uh, in subscription-based services is actually different from traditional B2B services. In traditional B2B services, our understanding is that um, uh, the selling happens, the selling of the core service and the add-ons happens in multiple stages. So they're in the first stage, you know, firms typically tend to just focus on the core service. They sell the core service, and sometimes they may sell one or two additional add-ons with the core service, but it's primarily the core service. And after some time has passed, once the client actually gets to know what the core service is and what the value of the core service is, uh, it's then uh, that the supplier you know, embarks on uh, cross-selling activities, like selling additional services. Now, Traditionally, it's been, it's been believed that cross-selling uh, in, in these traditional B2B services where selling happens in multiple stages um, can deliver uh, sticky customer relationships, increase uh, customer retention, purchase, uh, also increase purchase frequency of customers, uh, the contribution margin, um, CLV and profitability. However, majority of the research, uh, I would even go to the extent of saying all of the research in cross-selling has primarily been limited to uh, traditional B2B services. Um, but, you know, and, and that's where I think this study that I'm going to be presenting uh, will contribute the most because, as we know, uh, for those of us in the subscription, B2B subscription services industry, 
the subscription services uh, in the core service in the B2B subscription uh, industry actually sold along with a whole bunch of uh, add-on services. So both the selling of add-on services and the core service happens in one stage and at the majority of firms uh, in the B2B subscription services. Uh, and uh, this uh, phenomenon is based on the fact that majority of the firms believe that customer value is derived from selling both core and add-on services in the same period. Uh, also, uh, since, this, since subscription-based uh, services, uh, you know, um, essentially suppliers actually capture or derive revenue in a recurring manner, uh, they want to lock in the customer for a certain period of time with certain features. So uh, it's, a, it's been a practice in this industry uh, where you know, suppliers are actually selling both core and multiple add-ons within the same period, usually at the beginning of the sales cycle. And in fact, uh, a lot of suppliers are also incentivizing their uh, salespeople uh, to sell additional services during the initial sale. There's a lot of bonus-based schemes that are being deployed in this industry that incentivize salespeople to actually push uh, customers to buy a lot of um, add-on services along with the core service. So naturally, you know, when we... Uh, came across this phenomenon, our first uh, thought was, well, what sort of downstream consequences does selling multiple add-on services along with the core service at the beginning of the sales cycle you know, have for customers? Um, now, the, the key thing here is selling add-on services along with the core service, right? So that, that sort of uh, distinguishes subscription-based services from, uh, from any other services. So we partnered with uh, a B2B SaaS provider, uh, and this provider uh, you know, provides travel expense and invoice management software services um, to businesses in, in, in retail, B2B customers in retail, education, healthcare, manufacturing, and financial services. And uh, uh, this SaaS provider has operations um, across the globe uh, with uh, revenues approximately uh, 700 million per, per year. Um, and from a service standpoint, the SaaS provider offers a basic core service uh, along with 14 different add-on services. So you can think of these add-on services as, as audit services, business intelligence, and invoice management. Unfortunately, due to NDA reasons, uh, non-disclosure agreement, you know, I'm not able to reveal the name of the B2B SaaS provider, but this is a major player uh, in, uh, in, in, in travel expense and in invoice management. Now we've conducted three studies uh, from an empirical standpoint. Um, first, we wanted to understand uh, the cross-selling phenomenon in B2B uh, subscription services. So we conducted in-depth interviews with nine of the senior uh, firms executives just to understand what drives them to actually conduct uh, their business in a certain manner and how customers react to their selling practices. Then uh, we use archival data from this firm that includes um, se about 75,000 distinct subscription contracts between 2015 and 2018 across 37 countries. And finally, um, in order to understand the phenomenon uh, as to what is causing the effects that we are actually observing, we also conduct a scenario-based experiment uh, to understand you know, customers' perspective of how they feel when, when firms are selling multiple add-on services at the beginning of the sales cycle. So in, from our initial study, uh, we understood that usually so B2B subscription services are adopted in phases or deployed in phases. So there's an initial onboarding phase and then there's a post onboarding phase. During the initial onboarding stage, you know, like any software deployment um, that happens at B2B firms, they start small, usually the focal organizational unit with uh, fewer end users. There's a lot of learning that happens, trial and error that happens in the onboarding phase. But once it's successful, um, then the customer moves on to the post onboarding phase where um, it's scaled up. Uh, so the software is released to multiple organizational units. And after a point in time, after all of the bugs are resolved, 
um, the software, the farm enters the steady state. Now, our uh, initial interviews revealed that cus consumer preferences or customer preferences are different at different stages and which might actually impact the effectiveness of the number of uh, add-on services that are sold at the beginning of the sales cycle. So specifically in the onboarding stage, uh, we learned that a lot of end users are learning about the new service and service offerings. Uh, at the same time, organizational units are evaluating how the new service will uh, deliver value and how it will fit with the existing processes that the firms uh, are adopting, uh, that the organizational unit is adopting. And the IT department at the same time is trying to figure out how they can integrate this uh, service into existing IT infrastructure so the software can be used seamlessly by the end users. So a firm is incurring all of these costs. There's a lot of learning involved. There are a lot of learning hurdles. First of all, you know, previous from from previous research as well as from our interviews, we learned that uh, initially there's a lot of pushback, uh, as in, uh, you know, end users really don't want to adopt a new software, uh, and they want to conduct business um, as they have been conducting for many years. So there's always that initial barrier that the firm has to get across. But uh, what we learned is that barrier is usually uh, uh, surpassed you know, in the initial negotiation phase when the firm is trying to sell the software. Right? However, when it starts deploying in the onboarding phase, that's when the real learning starts. Um, the, the supplier firm sends uh, salespeople and, and technical experts that actually uh, transfer knowledge to end users, help end users get acquainted with the software and so on and so forth. When a lot of this ha is happening, we, as we, we can imagine, what we found in all of our studies is that selling a lot of add-on services along with the core services, uh, core service um, uh, exponentially increases the perceived complexity of the service. Um, we've got to understand, you know, when for when the customer is adopting this new service, there's al already uh, this negative uh, notion of, you know, that this this new software is going to cause cause a huge disruption in their way to day to day life, and um, which is why you know they're they're beginning with the mindset that this is not going to work. And additional uh, add on services will only increase that perceived complexity, and that increase in perceived complexity. Uh, is strongly associated with, negatively associated with uh, the retention in the onboarding state. So we, are, we were seeing uh, at firms, you know, where this com perceived complexity was really, really high, uh, customers were dropping out in the onboarding phase, right? However, once uh, a client gets past the onboarding stage, uh, end users would have already incurred a considerable uh, a cost in the learning cost in terms of gaining experience with the services. Organizational units have understood the value. The IT department has already integrated uh, the new service with existing infrastructure. So the firm, the customer uh, uh, actually uh, has this perceived notion of sunk cost and um, you know, so it's likely to actually embrace services, uh, more services as opposed to less services. So at this point, it's trying to actually uh, uh, derive more value out of the software. So what we uh, noticed was the perceived switching costs uh, at the customer go, go up. Now, this is, again, you know, we have to remember this is contingent on, uh, on the customer making it to the post uh, onboarding stage, right? So um, the add-on services actually lead to higher perceived switching costs, which then leads to higher retention in uh, post-onboarding stage. Now, another thing we also observed was uh, the communications actually play a huge role in mitigating the, uh, the, the perceived complexity or uh, increasing the uh, perceived switching costs. Uh, specifically, um, what we also noticed, this has been an industry trend uh, in the last couple of years, that suppliers are increasingly replacing their uh, field salespeople with, uh, with remote support, you know, for cost and efficiency reasons. As IT uh, technology is uh, widely adopted, you know, these uh, internet communication tools, um, for example, Zoom, you know, we've seen in the recent uh, past that a lot of firms Due to the due to uh, the pandemic, have really gotten used to internet communication technologies. So as the adoption rate goes up, 
suppliers are taking advantage of this and moving uh, a lot of their support services uh, to, um, uh, to, to, you know, from field to remote, right? However, uh, what we noticed in our research is that this is actually, this causes, uh, uh, this is a downside uh, for, uh, for some of the uh, mechanisms we were observing in onboarding and post onboarding uh, stages specifically, what we noticed is um, while richer communication channels enhance, uh, actually, uh, this needs to be a negative, uh, mitigate the perceived complexity, um, leaner communication channels actually enhance uh, the perceived complexity. In other words, uh, richer communication channels, such as face-to-face -face interactions, actually mitigate uh, the perceived complexity of the client whereas leaner communication channels such as, re, uh, that, uh, such as remote uh, support actually uh, enhance the perceived complexity. And uh, we've also found that this relationship between richer uh, communication channels, the moderating effect of richer communication channels is enhanced for organizations that are really, really complex. So for example, firms that are larger have more people to deal with, more processes to deal with. In, in such cases, uh, richer communication channels are even more helpful in mitigating perceived uh, complexity. Um, however, in the post onboarding stage, uh, richer communication channels um, actually uh, mitigate uh, the perceived uh, switching costs. So, when uh, firm, when customers actually get past the onboarding stage, uh, they, they're mostly looking for efficiency. They've already known uh, or learned how to use the service. So they know, don't need richer communication channels anymore. Um, they need leaner communication channels. They're looking for efficiencies in terms of just getting, uh, uh, you know, information on what they're, uh, precisely on what they're looking for. So they don't need face-to-face -face interaction. So richer communication channels are actually less effective uh, in the post onboarding stage. In fact, leaner communication channels that such as remote support are more effective uh, in the post onboarding stage. So overall, what we find is that uh, as firms sell, as suppliers sell more add-on services at the beginning of the sales cycle, uh, uh, you know, customers are, are, are facing this increased uh, complexity or, or perceiving increased complexity in the onboarding stage, which is leading to less retention in the onboarding stage. However, once customers get past the onboarding stage, they, perceived, they perceive higher uh, switching costs, which is leading to more onboarding stage. Now, obviously, we are probably thinking about, okay, so what is the right uh, number of, of, of uh, add-on services to sell at the uh, beginning of the sales cycle. And, um, you, you know, we were also uh, confronted with that question and our, our collaborating partner uh, firm wanted to actually understand uh, what is the optimal number of add-on services to sell at the beginning of the sales cycle. And it turns out it's three. The magic number is three, but it's at least, you know, uh, I, I, this is at one firm. So we don't know if it's generalizable to other firm, firms, but from our, our analysis, what we observed was that, you know, as uh, when the supplier actually was selling more than three uh, additional services, the customer lifetime value was actually going down. And this is across stages, both onboarding and post onboarding stages. Now the right-hand side, the left-hand side graph uh, shows you the customer lifetime value, um, you know, based on the number of additional services sold. And it also takes into account both the onboarding and post onboarding stage. However, when firms are not considering uh, attrition in the onboarding stage and collapse both onboarding and post onboarding stages and look at customer lifetime value, this exactly mimics what uh, practitioners think in the real world, which is as uh, firms sell more add-on services, um, you know, the CLV goes up. Again, this would be grossly uh, overestimating the CLV of a customer when you don't take attrition in the onboarding stage into account, right? And this bias actually uh, goes up uh, in different conditions. So we were looking at, you know, what would be the bias when, 
the organization size is low versus high, when firms use uh, tele-support versus online support, face-to-face -face, uh, support. Um, and, you know, what we noticed was this bias actually goes up uh, in more complex situations. For example, when organizational size is high, uh, firms are facing more complexity, so the bias is even higher. And the bias is even higher when uh, firms are using uh, online chat support. Right, so uh, let me conclude uh, with a set of key takeaways. Um, you know, they are, uh, so firms need to recognize that there are actually, suppliers need to recognize there are downsides to selling too many add-on services at the beginning of the sales cycle. Now, despite the cost concerns, there are benefits to employing richer communications uh, uh, channels, uh, actually leaner communication channels too, especially in the uh, uh, early on in the sales cycle. And leaner communication channels are helpful only after the perceived complexity in using services have been has been alleviated. So especially in the post onboarding stage. And what we also found was ignoring the onboarding stage leads to gross overestimation of the returns from uh, cross selling B2B services. So especially as more and more B2B services are moving towards, uh, towards subscription based services, it's important to actually estimate uh, CLV not as a whole, but actually split it up based on, on the phase uh, of deployment, phases of deployment, and then cumulatively assess uh, the uh, returns, you know, on um, selling these add-on services. With that, uh, let me turn it over to uh, Jigyasa. Thanks, Prof. Um, so what I have done is, um, and you know, thanks for sharing in advance the you know crux of the four. Uh, findings or uh, the four hypotheses that you've been testing with this particular organization. Um, if I may share my screen, I have put together a, a small uh, four slider and I'll mostly be, you know, talking through example. Can you guys see my screen though? Um, not yet. Not yet. Maybe I've not shared correctly. Let me... Uh, Okay, it's asking me for screen recording permission. Just give me a moment. Okay, maybe I'll just talk through the examples uh, because it's taking me to my system preferences to allow screen recording, etc. Would that be okay? Uh, sure. Or should I just email Prof Kiran my deck? Prof Kiran, should I email yeah. you my deck? I'll yeah. do that. And yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll just I'll just email you my deck. I'm sorry, I did not foresee that it's going to ask me permission for recording in some complex system preferences. So I'll just email my deck. Yeah, in the meantime, I just uh, want to kind of, uh, I think, uh, Vamshi, these, uh, these takeaways are uh, very interesting, especially, um, I think, um, um, your, your findings are not just uh, limited to I would say SaaS services or uh, even uh, in general B2B services. But I think uh, these are uh, uh, quite uh, generalizable to uh, B2B products firms also. For example, uh, when you're talking about uh, cross-selling uh, at the initial stage of your relationship development. So one of the most important things uh, for you to do is to kind of uh, make sure uh, you, uh, you um, gain the trust of your uh, customer, right? So right. when you are actually, like you said, when you are increasing complexity, so what? Uh, so uh, your opportunity to build the trust is also reducing because you know uh, now you have to be very careful in uh, using your resources to actually build the trust. So I think uh, that's that's a very interesting uh, uh, finding. And at the same time, as you rightly pointed out, uh, when it comes to increasing switching costs. Uh, Vijay Mahajan and his co-authors, they talk about three switching costs. 
as financial switching costs personal relationship switching costs and uh, switching costs related to time essentially right, right? so i mean perhaps all of these manifest you are right yeah right so so i mean the one you talked about the communication so that that is i would say more related to personal relationship switching cost in my view uh, maybe i think uh, those things can also relate to training cost um, perhaps i don't know how much time they have spent in sort of learning or i would say training and these kind of things might also uh, give you some uh, uh, interesting uh, Absolutely. In yeah. fact, you know, I I couldn't get into due to time constraints. I couldn't get into some of the things that we had discovered. You know, one thing we actually heard quite a bit in our uh, qualitative interviews from different mm-hmm. managers is the power of first impressions. Right. Mm-hmm. This goes back to your point on trust. Right. So there's a and and firms usually have a very short span of time when they can make that impression. And once you form that first impression. it's going to be really hard to actually uh, backtrack from that first impression right exactly. and and when you sell a lot of add on services and when you increase the complexity that first impression is going to be like this is going to be really complex and and there's going to be a pushback from uh, end users especially and if end users don't adopt the product no matter what the uh, execs think you know when they're actually putting together a contract or mm-hmm. you know there's not going to be enough support in the organization to continue with that service so we were seeing we were observing that a lot of end users were actually pushing back when the complexity tends to go up so that first impression and we were not able to capture that first impression through our archival data sources but we believe very strongly um, that that first impression really matters especially in b2b services I mean this could be extended to I guess traditional services as well but like I pointed out I think the fundamental difference between B2B subscription services and traditional services is that in Not traditional B2B. services you don't you don't you, you tend to see this happen in different stages that's actually built into these contracts that sure. firms sign right? Um, right however the the way B2B subscription service industry has evolved is they're trying to put everything into one single contract at the beginning and lock right. in customers right right because all of the acquisition costs that they actually incur can only be reaped if there are certain number of right. add-on services that are included along with the main core service right Absolutely. so it's a so, confluence of factors that is uh, that, uh, that are driving you know firms to do this but i think the general intuition uh, that firms have is let's uh, just add as many add-on services as possible to the contract and lock the customer in for an extended period of time yeah. right uh, absolutely so, i yeah. think uh, yeah so jigyasa uh, for some reasons i still didn't get the presentation but i, I think yeah, uh, you can go ahead maybe i think uh, and, uh, uh, yeah. I, i think it will reach in a few seconds because it's already out so okay, i'll sure. uh, th- this was really interesting uh, prof mamsi and in fact uh, i'll just you know I, and while i was listening to you i was really thinking about the real life examples that we have uh come across and i have come across in my enterprise tech sales career and uh, especially in one of the recent cases that i would like to talk about we solved the contracting problem for unilever and uh, the reason i can talk about it is it's in public domain bhaval kuch there cpu had given us a roaring testimonial on how we solved it where uh, you know a certain clm failed and all of that uh one thing that we have discovered as startup and uh, uh, uh while we talk about uh, you know selling services or even products is that um it's it's really that uh, uh you know inflection point where a sales person wants to bundle or sell as many um, you know add-ons versus what is the real and the most uh, you know um sort of telling problem that we are trying to solve and and that is where we hit the crossroad of uh, right uh, confluence of how much bundling or how much uh, you know uh, we should add on uh, in terms of so in in case of unilever we saw that the clm that they had was very rich it was uh, feature rich it ha- it was add on uh, rich and yet it w- failed in adoption so you know we have this concept of selling mvp first because adoption becomes really the key so what is the minimum viable product and why is it important to 
sell the minimum viable product and be the champion and say you know what you need to only spend so much this is going to be minimum viable product and you should not try to do phase 2 before doing phase 1 and we have seen whenever we have uh, practiced this with our client in fact we always practice this with our clients we have achieved much greater success than trying to make it a, a bigger sale and and we see this in our mro services also we do not ever go and tell them that we can you know solve 90% of your problems we we get into the detail we discuss and we try to find out that what is it that we can really solve for um and if it is only 30% we come back and say that you know this is the 30% of problem that we can solve and rest we can do in phase 2 or phase 3 if that discussion is required and i would love to hear from you prof vamsi if it in any way resonates with the first point that you made but at least i totally agree because we have seen it in uh, scenarios and once we were able to sort of solve that contracting problem for unilever we saw that they started involving us in digital transformation discussions where rahul and i would you know go and uh, suggest what else can be done and all of that um uh, which was again an add on on the current contracting service and not just any solution selling so so that was my sort of point uh, uh for the uh, cross selling in the beginning of engagement So, so you're you're actually spot on. Uh, uh, is it okay, Kiran, if I just I respond to Jigyasa, or do you want me to wait until she presents? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. I, I, I think I would love to hear your response, Prof. Mamsi, because you know, uh, then it sort of. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. So I think I think you make a very good point about customer needs and how many how how much of those needs you're meeting. and uh, from what i understand what you're suggesting is to the extent that you're meeting the needs and not exceeding the needs needs or you know creating this artificial need for the customer uh you will be able to get that again that initial trust which leads to more retention right uh i completely yes. agree with you i think um the the problem with the collaborating firm in our case was a mismatch between what the what they were doing from uh pushing the product standpoint as well as you know from a client need standpoint uh now if you think if you remember you know i'd mentioned that sales people are being incentivized to actually sell more right so from this firm right. and other firms that we've talked about um firms are b2b subscription services seem to be moving in this, this direction wherein you know their sales people are increasingly incentivized to sell additional add-on services because the margins that at least this is my understanding maybe you can validate uh when it comes to b2b subscription services you usually margins uh, firms make margins on the add on services not the initial core service if you think about uh the support that they have to offer if you take all of those costs into account really margins kick in only after a certain number of add on services so that is incentivizing uh Uh, uh suppliers to have these uh you know both bonus based incentive schemes for sales people where uh, they're they're encouraging them to push as many uh services as possible but i see your point you know it's really a a balance between what the customer wants and what the uh, client can offer so it's just a, bu- a different business practice i think in the end yeah um i i think uh, you, it's definitely when it comes to uh, pushing the sales quota or uh, you know actually uh, you know trying to uh, meet uh, the target revenue or uh, 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 you know really pushing uh, um, the the customer to buy more uh, it it becomes uh, uh, and and typically if you look at the crm kind of a solution which is purely subscription based and then they want to sell that one additional report but perhaps this is not the same in enterprise um, you know saas modules which are highly uh, sort of customizable uh, so to speak so again sap's of the world or aribas of the world or coopas of the world um, for that matter even salesforce salesforce has a mule soft which is like a middleware integrator and they also do a lot of customization for customers so so in those there is a lot of way to earn in a 
in a way uh, by making the mvp more useful for uh, customers and and i see uh, prof kiran if you can switch to the slide 3 sure. and and i see that you know people really uh, appreciate uh, you know if if uh, the adoption is uh, very good because that's where they see for bang for the buck and uh, that's where they see um and and you know very interestingly uh, prof vamsi and prof kiran what we've seen is that when we are competing with a lot of vendors and there are these rounds of uh, uh, demonstrations and all of that um one such demonstration i was part of because you know i was part of the digital transformation team at unilever while i was their vendor and uh, uh, you know i mean excuse my french but we thought that it was a feature puke and 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 the kind of thing that was being sold it just increases the complexity for people to understand and you know it just scares them that how and you know as a rule the technology should uh, offer that every next innovation or every next change should make it easier for people to work rather than you know pushing them to learn more ways of navigation from one screen to the other or churning out reports and so so that is and again you know that's the reason people are switching from point solution to a single digital interface and microservices and those kind of things so so that was my point and that at least that's what we have experienced that both in our mro commerce service as well as our saas service wherever we have actually count pushed the customer that please start small and then grow big we have one on relationship and we have one on longer term better sales figure also uh so that was one second moving to the leaner communication channels and it it sort of goes back to my earlier point of driving adoption so you know some of the uh, b2b saas which is again uh, have proven themselves by um becoming unicorns and have done really well in the market whether they're subscription based or others have failed in adoption or people switch more often because um in in the initial phase there's a lot of hand holding that is required now whether that hand holding is remote or it is face to face doesn't really matter but in um, so typically you know uh, uh, an example would be switching from a waterfall kind of a software development to an agile methodology of software development now one thing that becomes really important is in agile kind of software have these mini uat phases and you know why these mini uat phases are so important uh, these phases are important because you are taking the product to the end user even before the final release and there is so much engagement there is so much insight does not mean that it has to translate it in, into customization but and again i'll go back to the same example uh the the contract management had become so complicated at unilever that they had to introduce a layer of service management team who would just sit and input the contract now when we rolled out uat1 was in uh, istanbul i had traveled there and i was in a room full of people who had just opened the solution which is icat and even before i could start the training or tell them what to do they had created a contract already and that was just phase 1 of the solution it had it hardly had any features it had like four features out of 30 that were to be rolled out and they were so excited about it so so that is the level of communication we had put codings and and we saw that you know that in in um, by making that communication uh, very very deep with the end user as well as of course the rollout team we were able to achieve that so yes i mean i i completely agree um that it is very critical to gain that trust and plus you know it is it is also about that you are there it's not like i'm going to sell the software and then you figure out your life because i got my check uh that transactional relationship makes people very jittery whether they are very large organization or small organization so so that is uh, true um uh, prof if you can move to yeah. the next slide sure yeah and uh, sorry i think it was uh, yeah balancing oh, innovation yeah, sure, and risk yeah. yeah so um again you know uh, i think uh, it's also about uh, the complexity of deployment and uh, you know reducing the complexity of new solutions so uh, going back to my point of uh, the new technology has to always be sort of better than the uh, current technology 
but at the same time if if you sort of uh, you know have too many add ons and and if you talk about uh, uh, you know how the legacy uh, systems are going to be a sunk cost it actually i feel scares people and and going back to the point of you know with why a lot of people that we are talking to in europe and us are actually looking at you know getting a single digital interface and they don't want any more point solutions so so it's again about simplification i mean i don't know i'm just going back to the theme of simplification again and again because that's what we are seeing at least in the procurement and supply chain uh, field so prof kiran prof vamsi i don't know if you can come in and comment on that and i don't know how you feel about it or what you've been experiencing so jigyasa just to clarify is your suggestion to um, include a lot of features already in the core product so you have very few add-on services to offer uh, is was, was that your recommendation or no in fact my recommendation was to keep it as simple as possible the software itself the so, core service itself yes okay yes Yeah, I completely agree. This so actually aligns it. with uh, this aligns with uh, what we were finding uh, in in this particular case. You know, the provider that we worked with, um, like I said, the optimum was three. You know, they were selling fourteen, but the optimum was three. So uh, I, I I I had seen uh, the service, but since I was not the end user from a day to day standpoint, I couldn't comment on you know the simplicity of the core service involved, but uh if we were to actually look at three services as simple compared to 14 add-on services then it completely aligns with your intuition that so that you know smaller is better simpler is better always um yeah, but once and, they start and, seeing and the value about, then they would actually yeah. scale it up right so once they see the value yeah. with simpler software they're willing to actually scale it up because they they've learned Uh, the software now they don't want to let go of that software or go to another provider and have to learn the software their software completely all over again right absolutely so, absolutely yeah. yeah and i think the stickiness not just comes from multiple features i think stickiness comes from a very very simple point are you actually able to solve the day to day problem and make the life better point number 1 point number 2 how good is your user experience overall because i mean they don't care what stack tech stack you're using what are you doing but at the end of the day do i have an uh, you know ola uber facebook experience in an enterprise software is what matters because you know th this is the crowd that you're catering to so so yeah that and think about it you know simple things like microsoft outlook most of us end up using only 10% of the features but we end up paying for the 100% of the solution and it is also you know like a like a trap intellectual trap that cios and others fall into where they are very gung ho about i need this also i need this also and, and hello you're not going to use it ever in your life nor your users are going to use it it's just going to make your you know stack more and more complicated and and it's going to and you know this kind of a fresh view a lot of uh, established software vendors are not able to um, offer i feel that you know when i enter into these conversations i always throw a caveat that you know at moglix since we are practitioners and not a typical software vendor i'm able to have those conversations and convince them if you want five features let me give you three or if you want 10 i let me give you five and then we'll see how we build on it because maybe you don't need the 6 7 8 you will just need the 11th one to make your life complete you know so, you're so, spot so, on so, because if i could quickly comment on that <laughs> you're spot on because you know what we were also observing in this particular case was sales people were directly in the in the in the buying cycle right so you have the buying organization comprising of different execs along with you know an end user but end users are grossly underrepresented in the buying cycle there's probably one yes. or two uh, end users but it is those users that actually have to look at the software day to day so when sales people are interfacing in the buying cycle they're primarily interfacing with uh, decision makers and financial you know folks it folks and and people like that and they're able to offer these discounts to these people who actually don't use you know the software on on a day to day basis so you're right in the sense that you know we also noticed that um in the buying cycle you know people were actually wanting more you know 
to add everything right to the software so they can get the best deal so they were focused on deal making as opposed to day to day activities right exactly exactly so it's like if you give me 10 features for 5% discount i might end up with that perceived feeling of walking away richer but then when i come to ground uh, reality of deployment and adoption i might just miserably fail because i have complicated it beyond uh, it's required to be complicated right. and, so, and and that's where i think, yeah this yeah. Uh, really matters yeah, yeah. jigya sir i just want to add uh, one thing to uh, what you mentioned um i think um, Uh, so you're talking about uh, uh, whether to flare out by unbundling or to flare out with uh, augmentation essentially right so in the sense that you have a core product uh, you know you offer essentially five services but you're saying that for some set of customers so you will only provide three services okay uh, but uh, maybe for some type of customers okay who are actually emphasizing more of a sort of a relational relation- exchange right so you you may want to sort of uh, augment your product by sort of adding maybe uh, two more additional services right so yeah. i mean, uh, so yeah. i yeah i think it depends upon uh, like you said uh, the type of the customer and uh, the characteristics of the customer so what what is, what is their relationship orientation i mean and uh, i think during those initial discussions you will understand okay is it is this customer more of a transactional uh type or a sort of a relational type i think uh, that will also help you to sort of decide on um uh, you know the kind of number of services that you need to offer whether to sort of offer a sort of unbundled kind of uh, you know product or as um, more of an augmented product yeah yeah prop you know in fact customers are never transactional or relation type i think it's about reaching the right target audience and you know uh, when you talk to the uh, sort of end user organization so for in our case for example when we are talking to the cpo's organization rather than cio's organization it's very different conversation you know and and then that conversation helps us in understanding whether it is 1 3 4 we need to sell or is it 1 2 3 4 5 that we need to sell sure. and if you as a sales person being honest to uh, and very forthcoming rather than just meeting the sales quota it really helps you know i mean can you push back and say that hey you are doing wrong you don't need to do this do this and i have seen how it helps in building trust so interestingly I, you know we spoke to uh, at least 6 to 7 fmcgs headquartered in europe and and they were like uh, you know okay this kind of solution we have not seen or we have not heard and so basically somebody told them to buy these five things or one suit or something like that and it was a crazy amount of spend and complexity but then you know when you go and tell them that this is exactly what you want to do then they resonate more with you and that relation builds by the way after that so so at least that has been my experience i'm, yeah, I'm sorry it's a wider yeah of course yeah uh, so. yeah so if you can go to the next slide then yeah, i can sure. just conclude for yeah so um again i i am a big champion for the connected ecosystem i have seen uh, while you know we try not to experiment too much to become everything to everyone and you know we have been very very um, uh, selective in branching out only in the procurement and supply chain if that's what we want to do um, but a lot of disconnected and i think prof also spoke about it I don't know how many people even actually know that you know that uh, once Salesforce also has, for example, I'm giving the same example again, a connector which is a mule soft that they acquired, um, and uh, probably when they acquire it, it's more to reduce the complexity of connecting with, let's say, an SAP ERP because the HCI comes with a higher cost or whatever. But then it ends up becoming an appendage, and you might not be best at it. So then why try to sort of become everything to everyone? Uh, rather than not you know remaining in the connected ecosystem where you can actually um uh, you know add real value so for example um, you know while we have a uh, e-commerce portal for uh, b2b uh, which is the large manufacturing the the logical progression of what we are doing is so to begin with we were just integrating with their erp and trying to fetch everything automatically rather than somebody doing a manual input and making errors the logical enhancement was that we gave them catalog based buying that you know what we will give you a clean catalog which is very very rare in indirect mro kind of a 
world. I mean, while the Grangers of the world are trying to do it, but it's in a very different way. They are introducing the supplier in that ecosystem. So, so we've seen more success in 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 that scenario. And even with other vendors, when I do a competitive benchmarking, etc., I think TradeShift is a great example. They have built a beautiful ecosystem of connected uh, products, and they're doing very well. So, so that was sort of my last point that um, it's it's very important to uh, do a relevant kind of a, a cross sell. And I think when we are very relevant uh, cross selling, then it it becomes a bit of organic cross sell also if the relationship exists. Sure. rather than a push excellent jigyasa so thank you very much for sharing your thoughts and uh, so now let me actually take uh, a few uh, questions uh, from the audience so our audience have uh, some questions and uh, uh, i'll actually i have uh, taken some notes i'll go i mean i think a few questions have come in when you were talking uh, but one of the um, questions i mean to start with is uh, um, are these results applicable uh, for an operations and maintenance oandm kind of service based uh, solution so that is one of the questions uh, from the uh, participants uh, what do you think vamshi i mean he is talking about uh, subscription based services only uh, in a sort of a more of an industrial setting yeah so i think you know as long as uh, 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 so I'll preface my answer with a caveat, you know, which is, you know, I've not had much experience with uh, those sort of, you know, uh, suppliers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But my initial reaction is to the extent that they're able to parse out their services such that there's a core service and there's add-on services to mm -hmm. that service. I think uh, our findings are ap applicable. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I don't know if this sort yeah. of a setting is mm -hmm. uh, uh, transferable to an O and M, right. you know, uh, sort of a service. Yeah. So uh, that's great, Vamshi. I worked in O and M services uh, actually earlier. Uh, so uh, I mean, selling diesel gen generators and all to uh, you know different types of uh, applications. So I I, I think that uh, broadly uh, the findings actually are applicable. Okay, whether it is a subscription based or you know see for example like uh, in the initial stages don't actually uh, dump a lot of services on your uh, customer right so so that will increase the complexity of course i think it is kind of applicable to um, whether services or products or whatever the kind of uh, uh, you know uh, setting that you actually consider so and uh, another question uh, that uh, we have is that uh, can we can we impose uh, contractual restrictions Uh, to avoid attrition during uh, onboarding stage absolutely yes right. so um, however uh, you, you know that is actually wishful thinking i would say um, where you're giving uh, uh, the uh, customer the uh, ability or or not giving the customer the ability to actually uh, you know quit during the uh, deployment and and post deployment onboarding and post onboarding stages because one thing that client is going to push for is flexibility in contract mm -hmm. right so they want flexibility in contract it's like any relationship right so you want an out if the relationship is not working you want an out you don't want to suffer for an extended period of time so by removing that flexibility there's going to be some uh, pushback from the client you know in the initial buying phase uh, to the extent that you are able to uh, minimize flexibility and convince the client sure you know why not because um, you know if they're able to experience the software for an extended period of time the likelihood that they will start liking the software and build those switching costs is going to be higher but then would you want your client to actually suffer for an extended period of time you'll have to think from a provider standpoint from a supplier standpoint yeah. right you want to actually give them an out and minimize and cut your costs because you may want to actually go back and serve the client in the future if that is the case if they are suffering for an extended period of time they'll actually they're bound to remember that you know sure no absolutely and and if i can just come in there i i think um, it would be an interesting topic of research to think about it that you know like we have these are characteristic of people also you know there are people who are brilliant but they are jerks and there are people who are not so brilliant but they are nice people and and everybody likes them 
so if, if you if your product is great but your contractual terms are those of a jerk then i don't know how much your client is going to love you no matter what great product is you can't hold client on ransom that thought process itself is you know not right and uh, no long term relationship is built on by holding someone on ransom everyone's smart so we have to you know i think just make it work so i think uh, um, i maybe jigyasa you may want to take this question so uh, the thing is uh, uh, once she talked about uh, uh, factors from the uh, seller point of view like you know the uh, communication strategies and uh, uh, the other aspects that she talked about Uh, but one of the question uh, is asking about uh, uh, what are the factors from the client side uh, that will sort of impact the uh, sort of a uh, uh, i mean i, I would say uh, stickiness and retention uh, through uh, the uh, add on services uh, from the saas supplier yeah so so prof the you know i mean i think the stickiness from client really comes from whether we are solving that problem actually it's very simple answer and maybe it's not you know as i can't intellectualize it more and i think it's it's yeah. just about solving that problem in for real and driving adoption okay. otherwise you cannot yeah. succeed it yeah. that simple as that absolutely and and there is nothing else probably that we can do while we are selling a software to make the customer stick on or want more from you mm-hmm. because if if because you know in in all our lives whether it's a enterprise or it's a customer people can have multiple problems but there are only top 3 problems which is making their life difficult mm-hmm. you know in real sense so it it's the big big rock versus small rock versus mm-hmm. sand and you really have to attack that big rock and move it rather than trying to attack on the sand and the and 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 that's as simple as that absolutely uh, to add to that point you guess i think uh, one of the factors is uh, are you solving uh, any uh, existing problem but on top of it right. are you also solving that problem problems that they have never thought about okay that they might be facing down the line i would say 2 years 3 years 5 years i think uh, no exactly uh, yeah so exactly. i think uh, when you are talking about uh, talking to cios and the c suite executives and all so what they are looking at is essentially uh, innovative solutions okay in the sense that they might there might not be a, an existing need for those solutions but uh, you know if you can uh, show them that okay these are a sort of uh, uh, i would say latent needs and or the needs that are important for you to uh, perform better in the future perhaps i think that is yeah no i agree and i would like to give you an example you know recently there is a one of the world's biggest fmcg we were doing a poc for them where they wanted to understand okay. that what is the tier four supplier uh, ecosystem look like because of the covid situation you know they wanted that absolute traceability now you know i know that blockchain is still far away because you know there is no ecosystem that exists for it and maybe it is two years from now but even while providing a simple app for uh, poc i still would have to talk about blockchain in future or you know would you like to do a blockchain otherwise you know they would definitely think that these people are not spot on but uh, yes yeah, so you right prof kiran i mean you have to be futuristic you have to be innovative and you also have to see the latent need so not just 4 years from now a lot of times people are actually pointing to the wrong problem mm-hmm. so the symptom and the diagnosis are really not uh, in in place so yes you're right to that extent the add ons might come in there yeah so one so, one additional point you know i'll take take one minute and and uh, turn it over so uh, wh- when we presented uh, this research to the uh, to the supplier we went back and we showed these findings they were in in uh, in a complete awe in terms of the clv but uh another recommendation we made which seemed to have worked for the supplier is you know to have more representation from the end user in the buying process so usually buying process uh you know has a lot of uh, senior execs involved because there's a lot of lot at stake from a financial viewpoint but however you know the end users are the ones that actually actually have to deal with the software on a day to day basis so if there is more rep- representation in the in the process i think uh, a lot of these negative effects in the initial onboarding stage uh, can be um, alleviated uh, in my opinion so that is also something that 
uh, you know, uh, customers can do, you know, buyer firms can do to have more representation, right? To get uh, that initial buy-in from uh, customers. Yeah. Absolutely. Wonderful, Vamshi. Thank you very much. And uh, one of the participants asked, uh, give an example of uh, fear of switching. <laughs> so uh, what do you really mean by fear of switching in uh, sort of B2B market? So, if one so by you... fear of switching, you know, switching costs, what I mean is uh, just this trouble of going through the learning process, right? So that, that senior execs, again, might not realize, but actually a lot of training and uh, uh, learning is involved, uh, you know, in the actual deployment process. And it's a lot of sunk cost. And people in general are, uh, uh, are hesitant to actually uh, start using these complex systems, right? So because once they know the system, you know, there's very li little incentive for them to actually switch to a different system. So uh, from a switching cost standpoint, that is what I was referring to. That is, you know, the cost of actually going through the bidding process again, and uh, you know, going through the buying cycle in general, and then learning the software, new software from an end user standpoint, all of these are, are switching costs. Right? Yeah. So the change management also sort of includes the you know customization. So no matter you know how simple, even the most simple subscription-based CRM, people usually you know through the journey customize dashboards, they customize reports or you know, how the hierarchy works. And then going through that same pain again is really yeah. not easy. Exactly. So, yeah, uh, I think, um, uh, you know, we are already like 7.38. I mean, um, uh, so Asta, you may want to uh, kind of uh, make the closing remarks. Yeah. Sure, bro. Sure. So I would, uh, good evening, everyone again. And uh, as we come to the end of this webinar, on behalf of ISB CBM, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Professor Vamshi, Prof Ms. Jigyasa, and Professor Kiran for sharing their insights on B2B selling. These insights are extremely useful for the practitioners and gives them a new way to think about how they approach their customers. Uh, I would also like to thank the ISB staff members who have helped in organizing this webinar and reaching our participants in a seamless manner. And a big thank you to all the participants who have joined us today and taken time out from their busy schedule. I hope you found this useful. If you have any questions regarding ISB CBM and their offerings, or if your questions in this webinar have remained unanswered, you can reach out to us at the email addresses that have been shared in the chat box. So stay safe from the pandemic and have a great evening ahead. And thank you again, uh, professors and uh, Ms. Jigyasha for joining us today. Yeah, thank you, Asta, for organizing. Thank you, Minan, uh, for taking care of uh, the organizing right from the beginning. And by the way, Vamshi, we also have our executive director and uh, uh, professor of uh, marketing, uh, Professor DVR Sheshadri. And uh, he has been uh, uh, working with um, um, the, the B2B marketing gurus for the last, like, uh, I would say uh, 25, 30 years. And he is also here. Uh, uh, Hello, nice to meet you. Uh, Professor DVR. I think he's muted, but um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of mention that, um, you know, he's also here. And thank you once again, Vamshi, for taking time from your busy schedule to uh, speak to our participants. And Jigyasa, and thanks for your continued support, always. And, it's always uh, a pleasure uh, to come back to Alma Mehta. Thanks, yeah, Kiran, for having Yeah, me. great insights. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Kiran. Thanks, thanks, thanks yeah. ISB. And uh, thank you, Jigyasa. Uh, thank you, it's been wonderful to know the practitioner side of things. It's always, you know, that's one of the things that will, uh, you know, fuel a lot of our research that we do in the marketing community in general. So thank you for sharing those insights. And like I mentioned at the beginning, uh, uh, maybe you didn't join, you know, Kiran and I were talking and, you know, if there's any opportunity for us to get involved in practice and, uh, uh, you know, work with you in terms of understanding yes, of B2B subscription yes, services this, this more. Course, yeah. yeah. Right. Let's touch. Yeah. Yeah. So, Vamshi, uh, I'll send you uh, an email separately. I want to uh, talk to you a little bit. So, maybe uh, we'll set up a, a time in the next one or two days. Okay. Uh, so, otherwise, uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, everyone. Everyone, once again, thank you. Thanks to all the participants, you know, for the wonderful questions and also uh, coming to our. I, we look forward to your future participation. Thank you.